Good evening and welcome to Magana Prime Time. I am Piwogushe Mandisa Lamini. In our headlines tonight, Forte University celebrates 100 years, but students refuse to join in the celebrations. Students flag concerns over Rhodes University's transport system and National English Literary Museum to incorporate African language works. In our top story, today the University of Forte has celebrated its centenary. President Jacob Zuma and Zimbabwe's President Robert Mugabe were among the visiting dignitaries. The students were not impressed, though, as they boycotted the event and protested outside the main venue. Their demands to management, a food allowance and full payment of their national student financial aid scheme. Earlier today, I was there and filed this report. What kind of university do we want? And what kind of a student do we want to produce? We want to produce responsible citizens. Banning schools, libraries, and university buildings means banning the future in simple terms. Fort Hay University management secured an interdict against protesting students who planned to disrupt the centenary celebrations on Friday the 20th of May. Students were determined to make their grievances heard even in the midst of heavy police presence. We are not satisfied with the celebration of centenary. We are not satisfied at all. That's the problem that caused the students to go there and loot all the textbooks that were there at the ITX center. Our demands are not yet met, but in media they say um, the our demands are met. The students were promised to be given 25,000, the nine ones, but they are not yet, no one has given that. Utom agas chongi ubati na stingantoni. Ndwa enza is to impress abantu from ez ndawen, ez nkulu, kubababon, ba improvement. Ya iba, tina we are suffering apa asiki astin. Erez ufumantu ba with usi afazi infections. Ndwa focus on ngaibe, your reputation. As the students continue to protest outside and display their dissatisfactions on the centenary celebrations, inside it is still business as usual. The university's alumni and some of the country's ministers expressed their concerns as well as their hopes for the future of Fort Hare. As Fort Hare, it has a rich legacy. Um, it just has to find other ways of continuing to make its contribution for the betterment of humanity. I'm not happy to what is going on here because this is our university and things are not as good as they were at the time. Our young people must not be afraid to talk about their needs, their challenges. But now we fought for the liberation of the people of South Africa. And they have a right to raise their issues without it destroying anything. When we in the 70s banned uh, schools and the like, it is because we did not have representatives of our own. The system of the day would not listen to us. And therefore we had every right at the time to fight in a manner that uh, we thought fit would make uh, those in power at the time to listen. Although students were not successful in stopping the celebrations, they have vowed to continue protesting until their demands are met. I am Pio Gukiamandi Zadlamini, reporting from Fort Hare, Alice. Student safety remains compromised as some are left with no transport back home when the Opidan bus stops operating at 11 p.m. Lenny reports. I'm sorry. 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 I'm I will let like you overload. If we let like you overload, we are fine. If we are in the English, we So, see, I'm according to the title. As we pull them to the title. One time I was in the bus and there were five people left outside and we refused to leave, to leave them behind. 
because the, the driver said this was the last bus and they instructed him to leave and not to come back for anyone. Sometimes, ne, as an, as if the opulent bus is full, the, the driver tells you that you can't take an overload because of traffic, and then some students end up going to CPU and asking a leave from CPU, but CPU as well tells you that no, you can't take a leave from them, they just campus protection units. And then, yeah, some students end up sleeping at Jack Labs or at the 24-hour section at the library. The Opinion Councillor has not responded to the recent complaints regarding the OPI bus on the SRC page. This has led to the SRC President Gift Sandy intervening. When I get a call um, based on the bus, let's say it has left someone or this particular issue, then I contact the, the Opinion Warden and then we make plans as to how we're going to go about um, making sure that there's a second trip. And obviously that goes to the SRC's account. We now cross over to our field reporter, Lenny, who speaks to one of the students who shares her experience with the Opidan bus. I'm at the spot where most of the students who live off campus queue for the Opi bus. With me is Afika Jatezweni. She is one of the students who have raised complaints about the Opi bus. Afika, what has been your personal experience about the Opi? Um, well, I have to leave. Well, I work at the drain department quite late at night, and I have to leave at half past ten to make sure that I get into the queue in time to get a spot in the bus, because it's the last one, it's the 11 p.m. one, and by the time I get here, it's usually relatively long. And I think that's quite tricky, because now it compromises your time on campus, because you have to think of your safety. I don't even live that far, but I think of my safety, I literally live like around the corner, I cross the street from the arch, and I go around the corner. But it's not a matter of distance for me, it's a matter of my safety. Anything could happen in those five minutes from campus to my place. And also, um, I have been left before because I got here and I was the last person who couldn't get a spot. It was, uh, I mean, I didn't mind that I had to walk because it's not far at all. But again, it was that whole, now I have to look over my shoulder every time. I have to try catch up to maybe three people walking ahead of me, but they're not going to the same place. So, I mean, safety is always compromised. And I do really feel that at least the bus should go until midnight. And if we could perhaps get an explanation as to why it stops at 11 p.m. Because there are people who work here all night. There are people who find themselves having to sleep on campus because if they leave campus any later than when the OP bus leaves, that means safety has been compromised completely. Have you had to like sleep at the labs? I haven't, not literally slept, but I just stayed in the labs till the sun came up again so that I wouldn't have to walk too late at night. So, I, but I mean, I do know other people, my classmates, who have to sleep at night or maybe find a res friend to crash at so that they don't have to walk at night all the way downtown. There you have it. Students continue to walk home, even with the increase in crime rates in Grahamstown. Back to you in Studio People. Thank you, Lenny. And now for a quick ad break, we will be back with more from Makana Primetime. Welcome back. We now move on to new developments in Grahamstown. The National English Literary Museum under the Department of Arts and Culture has confirmed that it has extended its mandate to include African languages. Tingolenko Sazanam Tombeni reports. The National English Literary Museum is the first green museum in South Africa costing 127 million rand. It was funded by the Department of Arts and Culture, but with such a large amount of money being spent, it sparked conversations around the exclusion of African languages. Of those individuals is Professor Pamela Maseko, who speaks about her frustration of the museum's exclusivity to South African English works. I had personally gone to now and, and um, asking them, whether they would consider building up an archive um, of African language literary works. On the 18th of May, the museum held its first event in its new building, and the event was kicked off by an Isitkosa poet who set the tone for the rest of the evening. <laughs> When the Department of 
Arts and Culture and the Department of Public Works approached us in 2010 to start the planning process for our new building. It was a, an opportune time to plan the building so that it could accommodate the other indigenous languages. It's taken a while for the Minister of Arts and Culture to actually make the announcement, but we look forward to it. It's very exciting and during the course of this year the process will move forward, no doubt. Well, what Minister Mtetwa has said is just about two weeks ago in his budget vote speech, he announced that the mandate of this National English Literary Museum where we at would be extended to other South African languages as well. He said that it's very important that as we capture, as we collect, as we analyze the literary heritage of this country, that it should not be restricted to only what is written in English. And that marks the end of the first event in the new building of the National English Literary Museum as the building is still under construction. But in the meantime, members of the public can look forward to African languages being introduced into the museum as well as the possibility of a name change. I'm Tingolwenko Sazanem Tombeni signing off from Grahamstown. Student press organization Activate has put together a feature documentary titled Disrupt. The documentary focuses on the silencing of students and staff members during the hashtag Are You Referenceless protest. Afika Jadizweni reports. Hashtag Are You Referenceless protest that took place at Rhodes University campus. Student press organization Activate put together a 52 minute long documentary titled Disrupt. The hashtag Are You Referenceless protest was the result of a submission made on social media releasing the names of alleged sexual offenders at Rhodes University. The general expectation of the premiere was that the documentary would be an accurate representation of the actual events of the protest. I'm hoping that it's an accurate, well-balanced depiction of what happened, so I'm looking for something that um, kind of covers the full story. I do sincerely hope that it will be a complete, a whole representation of what took place. Activate premiered Disrupt on the 12th of May at the Barrett Lecture Theatre for students and Grahamstown locals alike. The documentary addresses the silencing of students and staff members from Rhodes University during the protest, as is explained by design lecturer Brian Garman. Management and the university has a machine for, for bringing out its own voice, and the student voice gets very lost in that. So the students need a space where they get their, their voice. Michael Dorfling, the director and the editor of the documentary, explains why the title of Disrupt is so significant. There's so many elements in the film that center around disruption and how we need disruption to change ways of thinking and change this societal you know, blindness to this issue. But also the film in itself is a disruption. With over 5,000 views on YouTube and set plans to screen during the Grahamstown National Arts Festival, Disrupt met audience expectations. It basically gave me some context on the whole protest. I felt like Disrupt really did a good job of capturing just the kind of energy, you know, that surrounded the protest in its entirety. Um, and I really appreciated that. This is Afiga Lolo Jadezweni for RUTV News, Grahamstown. A local Grahamstown resident has turned a dumping site into a memorial garden for his late wife. Plans are underway for the construction of a recreational sports centre for local children. Reporter Abner Akim paid him a visit. This garden I actually want to do for my wife. Not for anybody else but for her because that at least it takes the rubbish dump away there and put her board and her photo here and decide to call it Irene Solomon botanical gardens. Aside from the memorial garden, Cecil Solomon tells us why he extended his gestures further down the road and decided to focus on developing a playground and sporting complex. The reason why I did that is because that is the next empty sp open spot where they dumped rubble. We're going to have a cricket pitch for young C uh, uh, junior kids, boys or girls to practice bowling and batting. While the construction is in its early stages, we spoke to key members of the management at the community library, which is directly opposite the building area. It's also very 
meaningful to us if you see a nice clean uh, area environment, especially opposite the, the, the community library where we uh, currently work. And, uh, you know, most of the, 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 the children come to our library, visit our library. They can also use their facilities also after they come and do their homeworks and projects. It was a reminder of my heart that there are only one man in the community. Thank and the community. Dumping sites have often been a problem in the local colored community. That constant buildup of mess finally became too much for Solomon. The main thing is why I actually start this project is to keep Grangstown children out of mischief and to keep the rubble dumps away. As you can see, Cecil Solomon is doing fantastic things in the coloured community in Grahamstown. Apart from this lovely garden and the recreation facilities on that side of the community, he has also requested that recycling bins be put in place. Abner Ackham, RUTV, Grahamstown. And in other news tonight, Police Minister Natin Lego reveals that South African Police Services spent over 8.6 million rand on luxury cars for President Zuma's wives. French police raid Google services in France in search of evidence to support a case of money laundering and tax evasion. The search for Egypt Air's Flight 804 is still underway. Five days after its disappearance, some debris from the plane has been found. Taraji P. Henson, better known as Cookie Lion in the famous musical drama Empire, is set to visit South Africa soon for a meet and greet. Well, that's all we have for you tonight on Magana Primetime. I am Pio Gutlemandi Salamini. Good night.